Instead of asking what is right or wrong when we face a situation, if I'm asking that question, then I am making a decision about what I'm going to do. What if instead of me asking that question, I were to ask what would allow Jesus to express his life through me in this situation? Maybe this is the real choice that's before us. Welcome to the Mike Atkins Podcast. I'm honored that you've tuned in. My prayer is that as we study God's Word together, our hearts would be open to the life-changing truth of Christ in us, the hope of glory, to everything the Lord has done for us, but most importantly, to everything the Lord longs to do through us. Learn more about our ministry at MikeAkinsMinistry.com. So thankful for you and for the fact that you're sharing this time with us today. I want us to begin in Deuteronomy chapter 30. And what's happening now is Moses is putting before the people the commandments of the Lord. And he's essentially saying to them, I'm going to put in front of you today some choices. Let's look, for example, in verse 16. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go in to possess. Let's look back just real quickly at verse 15, because this is a critical verse. See, I have set before you today life and good and evil. Choices, life, good, death, evil. He speaks about the commandments. Notice what he says here in verse 17. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear, you're drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I announced to you today, you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose a life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. So here's Moses. He's speaking to the nation of Israel, and he's saying, I want to put before you some choices. Over here, there is life and good. Over here, there is death and evil. The choice is between life and death, between blessing and between cursing. And then he says this, choose life. And then he says this, choose life so that both you and your descendants may live. Choose life so that you may love the Lord your God. Choose life so that you may obey his voice. Choose life so that you may cling to him. And then he makes this important statement, for he is your life and the length of your days that you may dwell or abide in the land, which speaks of the promises of God. So, you know, there's an old saying. The old saying is that the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And this passage of Scripture really illustrates that in powerful ways. And when I was reading this passage this week, praying about what to share tonight, the Lord just began to bring forth revelation in this passage. It was so powerful. Here is God, through Moses, speaking to the people, and he's offering them a choice. Now, let's think about what the choice is, because it's going to, as we unlock this, it's going to just unveil something really powerful to us, so, so much in line with what we're always speaking about. He says, here's choice number one, life and good. Verse 15 of Deuteronomy 30, life and good. Over here, he says, is death and evil. Then later he frames it as life, death, blessing, cursing. And then he says, choose life. Now, what's interesting about this to me is that his concept of his his choice of choosing life had to do with keeping the commandments of God. It had to do with living under the lordship of the Lord. It had to do with doing what the Lord commanded to love the Lord, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, so that you might live and multiply, 
the Lord will bless you. But if you turn away from that, then you're going to be drawn away into idolatry and you're going to perish and you won't prolong your days in the promises of God. Here's what struck me as I was reading this. He's saying there's a choice before you, life or death. But here's what's interesting. In fact, for the people of the earth, that choice had already been made. Now, follow me for just a minute, because that choice is the same choice in a sense that was given to Adam in the garden. God pointed out to Adam two trees. One tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God said, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. The other tree that God pointed out in the garden was the tree of life. The tree of life, if you ate of it, you would live forever. In a sense, when I looked at this passage of Scripture, I saw that there was a similar choice put to Adam. Choose life and good or death and evil. I put before you life and death, blessing and cursing. After Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the earth was cursed because of them. Sin entered because of that. And what's interesting is that that condition then passed to all of the generations of men. Well, what does he say to Israel here in this wilderness area? He says, I put before you life and good, death and evil, life and death, blessing and cursing. Now choose life. And then he says, here's why. Here's what will happen if you choose life. If you choose life, both you and your descendants will live. But Adam chose death, and both he and his descendants died. If he had chosen life, that you might love the Lord your God, but they chose death, and they were strained from God. If you choose life, you will obey his voice, but they chose death and disobeyed his voice. If you choose life, then you will cling to him, but they chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they relinquished their relationship with him. And then notice this important word, for he is your life. What they rejected was the very life of God himself, eternal life, that which would have caused them to live forever, empowered by God's spirit living in their spirit. But when they died spiritually, eternal life never touched them. They were cast out of the garden broken relationship with God, and that spiritually dead condition passed to all. So in a sense, just follow me for a moment. In a sense, as they stood, Israel stood in that wilderness area, in a sense, the choice of death had already been chosen. They were already spiritually dead, and before them, all they had was the law. Well, what is the law? Wouldn't you agree with me that one definition we could give of the law would be the knowledge of good and evil? The law tells us what's right and what's wrong. The law tells us what we should do and what we shouldn't do. The law tells us what is evil and what is good. But I want you to notice this, as we've said so many times before. One thing about the law is the law gives us no capacity to choose good and to reject evil. All that the law can do is reveal to us what is good and what is evil, what is right, what is wrong, what is congruent with God's nature and character, what is incongruent with God's nature and character, but it cannot give to us any capacity to actually fulfill that which is, in, which is consistent with God's character. All it can do is reveal information reveals, but it does not give capacity to actually bring about change. So here is Moses in the wilderness with a group of people who have already been born under the decision of death that Adam made in the garden, and now he's putting before them a similar decision. But what I want you to notice is what he's inviting them to do, again, what God's always From the beginning of man's dealings with God, he's always been inviting man to a thing called life. Not religion. Life. And he says to them, I set before you life and good. Wait a minute. 
apparently life and good go together. If we want the knowledge of good and evil, we can get that by information, but it doesn't produce life. It just produces death. All it does is reveal to us where we're missing it. But if we choose life, we get good with it. I put before you life and good, or death and evil. Now, just hang with me, because I'm going to tell you there's something I'm about to share with you that I think is so powerful to understand. So here they are in the wilderness, being put before them is you can you can choose life or you can choose death. Death is what's going to happen if you choose out of your own will, your own ability, your own capacity, separate from me and separate from my life and separate from clinging to me and separate from me being your life. If you try and choose your own capacities and your own abilities, with that, you're going to choose death and evil again. But if you will choose life, and then he tells them very specifically what that life is that they're choosing. He says, for I am your life. What you're choosing is actually to allow me to be in you, to be for you, to be through you, what you cannot be in and through yourself. Now, we know that in the Old Testament, there is this, there's this period now where the law is at work. They're operating under the law. But what was the purpose of the law? The New Testament, where the Old Testament is revealed, makes it clear to us the law was never meant to be a source of life. The law couldn't be a source of life. All the law could do was reveal man's dead condition with the intent of pushing him towards life. And what was life? God himself, his own life, that was the life that the Lord wanted and always desired for man to experience. But man was so entrenched in his own self-righteousness, in his own faith and confidence, in his own fleshly ability, that he had to be surrounded by the law until finally the law would convince him that he could never find life and good through the law. He could only discover what was bad and good through the law, but he couldn't find it expressed through his life by the law. The only way that good could be expressed through his life was through God's own life, becoming so much the source and dynamic of his life that that was going to be the outcome. And that's what pushed the people of God ultimately to the message of the cross where man relinquishes his faith in his own fleshly ability, relinquishes his trust in self-righteousness, relinquishes his belief that he can somehow be good without God. It's impossible. By the way, let's look at a second verse of Scripture, which is in Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, hear Paul the Apostle, one of the most religious people that the world ever produced, a brilliant scholar a man of impeccable pedigree in terms of religion and self-righteousness. But I want you to see what he says in verse 7 of Romans 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. What did the law do? It revealed the truth. But notice what he says, but sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was once alive without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And when the commandment, which was to bring life, I found brought death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. In other words, what the law did, the law was pure, the law was holy, the law was true. The law revealed good and evil. But what the law could not do is it could not produce in man the capacity to do good, 
and not to do evil. All it could do was reveal the condition of man. And in fact, the Bible says that sin, this this problem that had developed in the very core nature of man because of his disobedience and being cut off from the life of God and his spiritual death, this, this principle actually awakened and grew stronger when the commandment came. So the commandment itself did not deliver man from evil and death. It revealed to man that there was spiritual death and evil was being awakened in him by the, the truth of God. So the law was a x-ray machine to show man his heart. The law was a, a diagnosis of the condition of man. The law could not give man life. It could only reveal death. Now, here's the thing. He goes on to say in verse 14 of Romans 7, For we know that the law is spiritual. That's true. But I'm not. I'm carnal, sold under sin. What I'm doing, I don't understand. What I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, then I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it's good. But now it's no longer the uh, the law, I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good. Listen to this, saints. How to actually perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. And he ends, as we know, in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Can you see here, we're going back. Moses is putting before the people life and good. Life and good go together. Life and good go together. They're married. Death and evil go together. They're married. I put before you life, death, blessing, cursing. On this side, we have life, we have good, we have blessing. On this side, we have death, we have evil, we have cursing. There's the choice. But here's what I want you to see. Listen to me. The choice is not between you doing good or you doing evil. The choice is between whether you're going to live out of your flesh or whether you're going to live out of his life. You see, the choice is to choose a life. Good is the byproduct. Blessing is the byproduct. But neither good nor blessing will be operative. Will you be able to perform in your life if you do it apart from his life? In the same way, Cursing and evil are a byproduct of death. When I operate out of the flesh, I'm operating in dead works. When I operate without God in my life, I'm operating out of spiritual death. So the choice before us is basically a choice between whether we're going to live out of our self-righteousness, out of our religious activity, out of our strategies and our ingenuities and our cleverness and our passions and our will and our emotions and our intellect, which is going to be producing death, which has as a byproduct evil and cursing, or whether we're going to choose life. And what is life? He makes it clear. For he is your life. He is the length of your days. And you may dwell in the promises of God if you'll choose his life. Now, in the Old Testament, this was shadowy, and it was part of God's process with man to bring man to the futility and frustration of his attempts to keep the law in order to reveal to him his fallen nature and condition and his spiritual death to drive him to the cross where he would recognize his need for a new birth. But what we can do from the New Testament is go back and read this and see 
the concealed revelation of the New Testament hidden in this in this choice that was put before the people. Now I want you to go with me another step. I want us to look, for example, over in Mark. In Mark, there's a beautiful verse of Scripture here that when you compare Scripture with Scripture, the revelation and the wisdom of God absolutely are mind-boggling. Notice what happens here. Very familiar verse of Scripture, Mark chapter 10, verse 17. It's also recorded in Luke and, and in Matthew. But here in Mark 10, it says, Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. Now, what was Jesus saying? If you're calling me good, what you're seeing in me is God. Because no one else is good. Because everyone else is operating in spiritual death, and with death goes evil and cursing. If you're calling me good, what you're recognizing in me is the Spirit of God, the presence of God. Then notice what Jesus does. Here's this guy. He's asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus points him first to the commandments. He says, you know what the commandments say. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud on your father and mother. Notice what the rich young ruler says. He answers, says to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Verse 21, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. He always operates out of love. But Jesus knew that this man was not being honest with his own heart because he knew the commandments could not be kept by the broken fallenness of man's human nature and character. So what Jesus did is he used one of the most prevalent commandments, thou shalt not covet. And he looked at him and he said, okay, then there's only one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come, take up your cross, and follow me. Choose life. And guess what the man did? He was sad at this word, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You see, what Jesus was doing is he was using the law that the man thought. In his pride, I'm a good man. I keep all these commandments. Jesus was, in essence, saying, okay, let's see. And instantly, the law did not lead the man to life. It revealed to the man the death that was in him. It showed him that he had a false perception of his own heart. You know, what's fascinating to me about that is this one word where Jesus said, why do you call me good for there is none good but God? What does that mean? What are we trying to get to? We're trying to get to life and good. Life and good, or death and evil. I'm giving you a choice. If you're going to choose the law, your own capacities, your own abilities, your own strength to try and do this, then all the law can do is bring you to death. If you want good, not just the knowledge of good, Paul had the knowledge of good, not just the will to do good. Paul had the will to do good, but the power to perform it. It has to come from his life. Choose life. What was the young, rich young ruler looking for? How can I inherit life? Jesus told him, choose me. But the rich young ruler walked away. He chose his own self-righteous perception of himself over what the law revealed, which was his desperate need to be born in the Spirit and to experience the life. Now, there's just a couple more thoughts. I want us to look at Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians 2, verse 10. Let's look at it here in verse 8, because it leads beautifully into it. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
Now look what he says. For we are his workmanship created, how? In Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice this. There's none good but God. If you want to see good, it has to come from life. We've been created now in Christ Jesus to do good works. Well, what must that mean? If we're going to do good works, then it must be his life that's going to operate through us. Notice that he doesn't tell us good works that we should do them. He says good works that we should walk in them. It's he who's going to do them because he's the only one who can do them because there is none good but God. But if he lives in me, then through his life, good not just becomes something I know or something I will. It becomes something that he can perform through me instead of it being my flesh operating out of dead works. Now look at this last verse of scripture to me in Colossians. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. What does it mean that we're going to walk in these good works? And notice what it says in Colossians 2 verse 6. As therefore you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. If we're going to walk, how do we walk in them, good works? It's by walking in him. Why? Because his life is where good becomes not a theory, not a desire, not an interest, not an intellectual understanding. It becomes an actual operative principle. Is by the power of his life. That's why back in Deuteronomy, he was saying, I'm giving you life and good or death and evil. Hear his blessing, hear his cursing. Choose life. What is life? I am your life. I'm asking you to choose me. Stop trying to do in your ability and your capacity what you think is right, even if you're trying to do it for me. Rather, let me take up residence inside of you and then relinquish control and let me operate my life through you. And that's when good will no longer be a theory. It'll be a reality because what I do is in perfect harmony with my father's nature and character. You know, I wrote something in my notes. Think about this with me for just a moment. I know these are deep waters, but you all have proven to be capable of, of going into some deep waters with me. What if I wrote, instead of asking what is right or wrong, what is good or evil when we face a situation, what's the good thing to do or the evil thing to do? What's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? You know why I say that? Because if, if I'm asking that question, then I am making a decision about what I'm going to do. What if instead of me asking that question, I were to ask, what would bring death in this situation and what would bring life into this situation? And then I define life as being what would allow Jesus to express his life through me in this situation versus what would cause my flesh to be expressed instead. Maybe this is the real choice that's before us. I put before you life and good. There's none good but God. We've been created in Christ Jesus for good works that we should walk in them. How do we walk in them? As you began in Christ, so walk in him. Or death, evil. What does that mean? Evil, it means more than just what we think of as terrible things. It means something that's twisted, something that's out of sync, something that's not in right relationship to truth. Now I'm over here, out of my flesh, producing things, me trying to produce things, but out of my flesh, Paul said it, in my flesh there dwelleth no good thing. The Bible says the flesh profits nothing. The Bible says no flesh can glory in God's presence. The Bible tells us that the flesh is unprofitable and incorrigible. So if it's coming out of, okay, I'm going to decide this is good, this is bad, this is right, this is wrong, and this is what I'm going to do. Guess who's doing it? Me. 
But if I say, Lord, how can I get out of your way and let your life be expressed in this situation? Not operate on my flesh, but let your life, because what is going to happen if Jesus shows up? Good is going to be the inevitable outcome. Can I tell you, we don't always know, based on our knowledge base, what the right thing to do is. Who would have counseled Jesus to walk into the temple and throw overthrow the tables and drive out the money changers? We think, well, Jesus just lost it there. You know, he just sort of, he had a complete breakdown and just went out, you know, in anger and frustration. But that's not true because Mark tells us that Jesus was in that same temple the day before. He looked at everything. He saw it all. Everything he saw the next day, he saw that day. But the Bible says expressly, but because the hour was late, he left and went to Bethany and spent the night. The next day he came back into the temple. And that's when he overturned the tables and the money changers were driven out. Why? Jesus didn't lose it. Jesus didn't just explode in temper. Jesus was being led by his father's life. He went into a situation, he saw it as it was, but by the virtue of the life of the Father operating in him, he knew this was not the time. The very next day, he went and the Spirit of God directed him to do what he did, and so he operated. So you see, we think, you know, the Bible says that the wrath of man cannot work the righteousness of God. We think we're going to walk into a situation and we know what's right, and, and we're going to just get involved and straighten things out. But you see, the wrath of man, where, why? Because it's of man, does not work the righteousness of God. It's only when his life is being expressed through us that righteousness is coming forth. Only when his life is being expressed that good is coming forth. We may call it good because of our definition and our knowledge base, but it's only good, it's only good if it's God. Because there's only one who is good, and that is God. So think about this with me. When we're facing life, as we begin to understand and plumb the depths of the real revelation of what the Christian life is really all about, it's about his life. We can go back in the Old Testament and not pull the Old Testament into the New Testament and try and make it our new doctrine, but to recognize that in the Old Testament, God was giving the law to expose man, just like Jesus gave the law to expose the rich young ruler, to try and reveal to the rich young ruler the fact that the law was not something he was keeping. In the same way, the Old Testament was to reveal through the law the fallen nature of man and his spiritually dead condition to bring man to a place of brokenness and humility, to fall upon his knees and say, God, I need life, your life. I can't do it. We think that's when God gets disappointed when we admit we can't do it. In fact, that's where he's trying to bring us, is to a complete place of no longer the circumcision, he says. The true circumcision are those who worship God in spirit and who put no confidence in the flesh. That means we've got to put confidence somewhere else. Where? In him. In what he can do in us and through us that we can never do in and through ourselves. Saints, think about this with me. What circumstances are you facing? How many times have you faced a situation and asked yourself, okay, what's the right thing to do here? What's the wrong thing to do? What would be good? What would be evil? What would be the smart thing to do? What would be the dumb thing to do? How many times have you tried to figure it out in your own situation and then garnered your resources of your own intellect, your own emotions, your own will, your own you know personality, and then tried to accomplish something, even if you're trying to do it for a good cause? Can I tell you where the Lord is trying to bring us is where we'll stop doing that. We recognize that we're not under the law anymore. We're under something more powerful than the law could ever be because all the law could do is talk to us about things. It could never empower us to do the right thing. What we're under now is a different law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. 
for the spirit of a life in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 2 tells us, is what sets us free from the law of sin and death, which is in us. That law doesn't go away, but it becomes superseded by the power of his life. When we got saved, our spirit was made alive when we were spiritually dead. Then his spirit came to take up residence in our spirit. And now I'd suggest to you, he's saying to you and I the same thing he was saying to Adam and Eve in the garden, the same thing he was saying to Israel in the wilderness. I put before you a choice. Life, my life, and good, my character and nature expressed through you, or death, your flesh, and evil, your ways. Stop trying to do it on your own. Stop trying to manufacture or produce a life that you can't produce or manufacture. And why would you need to? You're a branch now in his vine. What you have to do now is just let his life have access to you. Maybe in this next week, you might stop and pause in various situations that you find yourself. You know, we don't start to learn to fly in a 747. You learn to fly in a Piper Cub. It can be something very small. And you just sit there, and, and just before you speak, just before you act, just before you engage out of your own natural world, you just stop and say, Jesus, I want to stop trying to figure out what's the right thing or the wrong thing to do. I want to stop trying to figure out what's good or evil here. What I want to ask you is, what could I do right now that would allow you to express your life through me? How can I get out of your way? I don't want to come up with something that's going to express me, my opinion. I want to find out what is it that you want to do through me right now. Can I tell you, the guarantee is this. If it's him doing it, it's going to be good. Amen. Weigh some of this in your spirit. This is deep waters. Go back through some of these scriptures. Consider the beauty of the tapestry of revelation of scripture and how perfectly it fits together. And the law has driven us to the cross. The cross has given us Christ's life. Christ's life can now do through us what the law could not produce in us. Because he is the word, and he can bring forth a life we could never comprehend. I want us to pray together tonight. Father, as we think about the extraordinary depths of the revelation of your word, we're just stunned at times. I understand why Paul the Apostle, sometimes right in the middle of a letter, he'd just stop and say, oh, the glory of the wonder of the riches of the wisdom, the power of God, how far his ways are past finding out, how rich and wonderful the revelation of who you are and what you came to do is. Lord, it's not for us to go back and try and unravel every mystery of former days, but what it is for us to do is to enjoy the mystery that's been revealed to us. And what is that mystery? Been hidden before the foundations of the earth? It's Christ in us. Colossians 1.27, the hope of glory. Lord, help us to enjoy, to embrace, to awaken our hearts to the glory of that revelation and to learn that good and life, your life, go together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what an honor to have shared this time with you today. I only have one request. If this message has been an encouragement to you, please share it with someone that the Lord has laid on your heart. We have a few additional resources for you as well. To learn more about them or to get in touch with us, log on to MikeAtkinsMinistry.com or just click the link in the show description. I'm Mike Atkins. See you next time.